Who do you chair? Can I say that? I think people are like, well, we're the robes tie dye. Like, <laughs> we're about to do a bunch of chanting sort of thing. So that's not who I am. That's not how I roll. And if I do my job today, this is the terrain that we are going to cover. All of you will have a pretty clear sense of the three pillars of meditation training that I think are essential to what we're doing here at Wisconsin Athletics and for others to consider as well. We'll dig into some of the key scientific foundations of what we think are there that allow this training to be impactful. What are some of the current research projects that we have in the works and what are some of the ones that will be coming down the pike and open research questions? And then what are the ways that we can skillfully move this forward. So I invite you to be thinking like, what is your expertise? What is your point of view and how might it contribute uh, to advancing this work, you know, inside the walls of Wisconsin Athletics at UW-Madison and beyond. So I want to tell you a little bit about me as we get underway. So uh, I'm born and raised in small town, Illinois, proud son of Mike and Gail McGee. Uh, and then to be totally transparent with you, at 17, a whole bunch of suffering showed up in my life. And I had a choice to make. And I knew I could either turn from it, I could hide from it, I could run from it, or I could turn toward it. There was some quiver in me that said, you have to turn toward it. You have to find a way to go through it. And so that put me on a path, how to do that. And I didn't know how to do that. So I started searching. And it wasn't really until I found mindfulness and meditation that I felt like I had both kind of the moment to moment ways of working with that, but also the frameworks to be able to handle that in a sustained, ongoing way. Never thought I'd teach anybody mindfulness and meditation. Okay? There's an old joke in this business. How do you know if someone's a meditator? Just wait five minutes and they'll tell you. Like that person's annoying and not an effective teacher. And so I was waiting, just benefiting from the practice. And my first career was as a public school teacher. And I felt like I had something that could benefit these kids. It could benefit my stressed out colleagues. So I started to share with them. And they started to benefit from these practices. Then I started to get hooked, like, okay, what are skillful ways to teach these practices to other folks? I had a chance to join a group on campus called the Center for Healthy Minds. I'll say more about them in a minute. But there I started to work with a wide range of populations, corporate groups, healthcare groups, uh, and law enforcement groups. I'll say a little bit more about the law enforcement work in a little bit. I still do some work with law enforcement groups that's similar to what we're doing at Wisconsin Athletics. Uh, training uh, with FBI SWAT teams and some of the very same practices and concepts that we bring into the sport environments here at Wisconsin Athletics. First person uh, in an athletic environment that I ever taught meditation to was at Kent State University, because you never know, right? <laughs> My sister-in-law was an academic advisor there, uh, and Kathleen Weiler, who may be on the call if you are, shout out to Kathleen. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't get the opportunity to meet Kathleen. Field hockey coach at Kent State, said, hey, would you ever be interested in sharing like meditation stuff with athletes? And I was like, sure, I don't know if that's possible. Right? Can we do this? So we started to explore a little bit. We did that for a few years, that really benefited. And then I had an opportunity to work with uh, some retired football players, uh, many of whom went here at UW-Madison. One of them was Chris Borland, played football here, played in the league. And then after Chris retired, he wanted to do something to benefit others who had played the game. Long story short, we created this eight week mindfulness based training for retired professional football players. We didn't know what would happen. Would they think like, you know, what are you talking about, man? I played D-line in the league. You're gonna talk to me about what? <laughs> Meditation? And that's not what we found. They found it to be beneficial. They found it to be rigorous. And some of those guys were still on staff at Wisconsin. So they said, hey, we think some of our current athletes would be interested in this. So then we started to explore Wisconsin athletics for a few years with small pilot ways. Ultimately about two years ago, resulting in the creation of this position that I have, as director of meditation training, as Pete said, is a first of its kind position in the country. There's some stuff that's on this slide that's implicit that I wanna make explicit. I'm white, I'm male, I'm cisgender, all sorts of other identities that have impacted me and continue to impact me. I do my work to understand that and understand the impacts of that, but I will make mistakes and I invite you to call me out, call me in when I do. So I think there's the three main areas that we really have to be cognizant of with meditation training. So first is the training. This is the boots on the ground. This is the time with athletes. This is the time with teams. There's also the frameworks, kind of how does it fit together? How does it fit with other components of what we're doing in sport environments? And then the third, of course, is research. And this is where we're gonna spend most of our time today. But I wanna talk a little bit about the other two areas as well. So from a framework perspective, what frameworks am I pulling this work from? It's not just Chad like making stuff up because I think it's fun and interesting, right? Like there are frameworks that we're pulling this from. So this represents 
two of those. So the gentleman on the right is a neuroscientist. So we're pulling from psychological frameworks that we know out of the research. And then Matthew Ricard is a Buddhist monk. We're pulling from contemplative frameworks. Matthew Ricard also happens to be a microbiologist. Isn't that crazy? Microbiologist and then like a 30 year monk. He's incredible. We're also pulling from what we at Wisconsin Athletics refer to as Forward 360, many of whom are represented in the room today. So Forward 360 is kind of a holistic wellness program to support all of our student athletes. This includes a lot of groups, but one that I want to call in particular is a close and unbelievably important relationship with clinical and sports psychology. I am not a licensed mental health provider. The Venn diagram between meditation training and clinical sports psychology has a lot of overlap. So we've spent a lot of time together to come up with scope of work practices, how we work together, uh, what our relationships are, and that's been a powerful and ongoing collaboration. Of course, there has to be work with coaches. How does this fit into environments? How does this fit into overall training uh, and with athletes? So we have, you know, Graham, we have Grace, on this. So how do we fit this into the busy life of student athletes? They've got a ton going on, right? So these are some of the framework things that we have to consider. Of how does this come to life in these environments? From a training perspective, first time I walked into the football weight room, I go up to one of the coaches who looked like an Under Armour mannequin come to life. I didn't know humans had shoulders that big. I said, hey coach, you know, like, what do you do here? And he's like, well, basically my job is to get guys bigger, faster, stronger. And I thought, ooh. What's the corollary in my work, right? Because we've all seen versions of that in every weight room everywhere. So what I'm interested in is how do we train minds to be more focused, more resilient, and better teammates, which are things we talk about a lot in sport, yet oftentimes we end up in this mental training paradox of not actually training for them. The role of internal champions with training, I cannot overstate it. It is huge to have people on the inside, whether they're sport coaches, strength coaches like Kevin, others, who have enough influence inside the team and have enough personal practice and buy-in to sustain it over time. Work happens at a bunch of different levels, happens at a team level, small group, one-on-one -on -one level. And then the training, some of them are standardized trainings, modules that kind of can be repeated over time. Some of them are built kind of on the spot. Um, so there's a huge variety of what the actual kind of content of the training is. And the last thing I want to call out, this isn't a great picture, but what this is, is the top thing on here is staff meditation training. And then there's all, you know, compliance meetings, staff meeting, just like the normal stuff of an athletic department. So integrating meditation training in not just for student athletes, but also for staff. All right, now we're on to the meat of the matter, the science, okay? So I mentioned this group, the Center for Healthy Minds. I was based there for six years and still have uh, an honorary affiliate role there. So this group was founded by Dr. Richie Davidson on the right, neuroscientist by training. He was the first person to really start to do rigorous scientific research on meditation. Up until that point, he had been told by his peers, you can't study meditation in your scientific career. You will tank your scientific career. Fortunately, he didn't listen. And in some ways, kind of single-handedly has created an entire field that we now call contemplative neuroscience or the science of training the mind. The center now has 15 PhD level scientists all working around these central questions of what constitutes a healthy mind. When I was there, and I'm a former college soccer player, I always saw how this stuff could show up in sport environments. But I also have an attitude that you don't teach meditation until you're asked to teach. Okay? But I had a question. Is it possible to teach rigorous, high quality meditation in a high performance environment? I did not know the answer to that question. So I'm gonna take you a little bit on the journey of how I started to think through that and continue to think through how can this stuff come to life in these environments. So the first thing, we know scientifically the simple truth that neuroplasticity is a thing, it's real, right? Your brain is constantly being trained. The question is who's in charge of that process? What qualities of mind are being trained? Do we leave it up to circumstance and just kind of hope that it works out? Or do we take responsibility and train our minds for certain qualities that we know are going to be important for both performance and well-being? So the way I think about this is really strength and conditioning for the mind. So I'm not assuming anything is wrong with anybody that I'm working with. I'm not trying to fix anybody that I'm working with. I'm taking them from where they're at and moving them forward. Good to great, great to elite. That's what I'm interested in doing. So when I first started to think about this work and you know, at the theoretical level, is it possible? What scientific evidence is there to suggest that this is even a possible reality? So we're gonna walk through a study now that uh, Antoine Lutz published with Richie Davidson. 
Uh, looking at recovery from negative events. So on the right, the two groups are non-meditators, so folks with no practice experience, and then long-term meditators, folks with lots of practice experience. These are like Olympic level meditators, like thousands of hours of practice. Had them in the fMRI and the brain scanner, looking at the part of their brain responsible for perception of pain. And the study design was in the fMRI, and then they would hear a tone. And then a few moments later, they had a band on their wrist and they get a heat shock, like a painful heat shock, just below the level of the burn. So they started to habituate. Sound happens, painful stimulus is coming. So this is what happened in the study. So we're beginning with the long-term meditators here. So they're in there. The pain part of their brain is pretty stable. And then that sound comes, stays stable. And then the negative stimulus comes, it arrives to the wrist, shoots way up, right? They're experiencing the pain. The stimulus is there for a moment or two, then it's gone, comes back down to baseline. Now let's take a look at the non-meditators. So similarly, this part of their brain responsible for perception of pain is stable, and then the sound comes. What do you think happens? Yep, shoots way up, right? This is just the sound, right? Then the negative stimulus comes, that actual heat shock is there, right? So they experience it, it's there for a moment or two, and then it's gone, and what do you think happens? Exactly, right? Stays elevated for a really long time. So as you look at this, you may be seeing yourself in here to a certain degree, right? Noticing those things. Think about it, even if you signed up for this, you know, experiment and you heard that sound, what would go through your head? Why the hell would I sign up for this? Am I that hard up for 50 bucks that I got to shop myself, right? Whatever it may be. So when I saw this, I immediately thought about athletics. Because what happens, right? If an athlete's about to push heavy, right? Is their mind get engaged well before that activity comes? The brain doesn't know a difference between a real threat and a perceived threat, right? It reacts all the same, right? Or after the stimulus is gone, it's not like they say, hey, you know, we'll just call a timeout, take, you know, half a day of recovery. You know, if you want, we'll finish the game tomorrow like when you settle down. Like, of course not, right? The next play comes, right? So I'm struck here looking at, at Grace, member of the volleyball team, two championship points. Damn, two championship points. Right? And I'm not trying to claim the meditation is the reason Wisconsin volleyball won the national championship. <laughs> like, Grace and her teammates are the reason Wisconsin volleyball won the national championship. But just by way of example, you know, so, you know, we think the championship is won, right? Call comes in, oh, we're going to review it. Terrible call, by the way. Set that aside for a moment, right? But then the next play comes, right? Is the team still up here with, I'm lost, I, I can't believe, you know, we have to deal with this, like what's going on? Or did they find a way to come back down to baseline and perform from here, right? So we know our performance is going to be completely different. So at least scientifically, this was my first sign of, okay, I think there's something in sport environments where like this sort of training could roll over, could be applied. I mentioned some of the work that we've done with law enforcement officers. So law enforcement officers uh, and uh, high-performing athletes, I think have a lot of things in common, right? They're performance-focused environments, right? They're high-intensity environments. They're also not environments where you would typically think, oh yeah, they're probably gonna do a bunch of meditation. So well, I was really interested in exploring in these environments. So I'm going to share some of the research that we published there. First, out of these findings, and this was after about eight weeks of training, was we found that these officers had reduced perceived stress. I think this is unbelievably important, right? Because the world didn't get less stressful from week zero to week nine when they did pre-test, post-test. What changed was that how they perceived it, and they perceived it as less stressful. So we think about our student athletes, do they experience a lot of stressful things, academically, athletically, socially? Yes. How they perceive it has a huge dramatic impact on the impacts of their well-being and their performance. Reduced anxiety and depression. We know for this age group of student athletes, these are the worst anxiety and depression rates we've ever seen. Okay? Anything we can do to move these needles is gonna be really, really important in developing these skills and also doing it in a way where it, I think one of the things that we've been able to do somewhat successfully in this work is do it in a non-stigmatized sort of way. This is what it takes to perform at really high levels, is this sort of training. And guess what? You've got emotions, you've got thoughts. Let's develop skills to be able to work with them. And then we start to see these sorts of impacts. Improve sleep quality. Anyone here ever have dysregulated sleep? Yeah. And what happens to all aspects of your life when sleep is off? Not good, right? 
So if we start to get sleep in line, all sorts of positive things start to happen. And the last, and this, you know, somewhat specific to law enforcement, I think we can, you know, start to draw some connections outside of law enforcement. But PTSD in particular, we saw it in two areas, hyperarousal and re-experiencing. And hyperarousal, right, is the body getting ready for an experience to be able to handle the intensity of it, right? But not in the appropriate time, right? It's doing it in time that no longer makes sense. When we think about athletes, they want to get that kind of like peak arousal at the right time, right? So it's developing those skills to apply it in the right circumstances. And of course, re-experiencing is thinking something is happening now when it's actually not happening now. And how many athletes do we know are reliving things that happened in the past that aren't happening right now? And if they can develop skills to let go of that and get present, we're going to see performance go up. So this was the second area where I was like, okay, we can do trainings in these high intensity, high performance, traditional and masculine role environments and start to see empirical evidence of the change. But what do we know about it in sports? What research exists in the scientific literature around sport? And caveat, so this is a, a, a paper that was recently published by collaborators Scott Anderson and Drew Watson in the kinesiology department. There's a lot we do not know. Mostly, we do not know. But there are shreds of evidence that are starting to suggest that this training may be helpful, okay? So what are some of the things that we see? Uh, increased focus. How many times in sport do we say one rep at a time, one day at a time, next play, right? Millions of times. How often are most athletes training for it? Not that often. At Wisconsin, we are training for it, right? Be able to do that. Reduced overthinking, right? We all know what that feels like to be spinning kind of out of control, right? As something happens, it makes me think about when we first got this training underway a few years ago with the football team. We finished one of the practices and we talk a lot uh, 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 in meditation around finding that balance of relaxed and alert. And one of the players who I will casually name drop because he's, you know, kicking ass right now, Jonathan Taylor, <laughs> JT, uh, shared that that's how he feels, that relaxed alert, when he's at his best pre-snap. He's present, he knows his responsibility, but he's not overthinking, right? And then he can just go play, right? Kind of trust, see what happens. Supportive of flow states. Every athlete knows what this feels like, uh, and it also feels random when it's experienced. And it's also, if we try to make flow happen, it's gone, right? It's impossible to do. So the research suggests that by doing this sort of training, it creates the causes and conditions to make flow states more likely. Injury prevention. Of course, if we increase things like proprioception, then we would expect athletes to have more awareness to be able to avoid injury, reduce anxiety and stress, we already talked a little bit about, and increased well-being, right? So this research is hopeful, but it also begs a lot more questions, right? Like we don't know, a lot of this research was done with very small sample sizes. Almost none were done in randomized control trials, right? They're also done at various levels of sport, right? Also, what, what do we even people think is mindfulness and meditation isn't always the same, right? So there's reason to be hopeful, but a lot more research questions that come out of this information. So I wanted to share a couple of things that I think are kind of in the works to allow some of these impacts to come. So one, if an athlete is interested in being at their best, I think there's four areas that they have to be deeply concerned with. The first is, of course, behaviors. And this is the most easily identifiable, right? This is like what a coach can see, right? This is what easily shows up on film and we can, you know, we have masters that are able to coach at this level and make these changes. But there's always emotions that are happening, happy, sad, joy, curiosity, fear. These are all normal. You're a human, you're gonna experience these emotions. And then there's senses that are happening. Some of it is sensations in the body, but there's other senses, right? Sound, sights, and of course, thoughts are always happening in our mind. So. I think about this behaviors is just the tip of the iceberg. We need to have skills to be able to work with everything that's happening underneath if we want to have behaviors that are going to be lined up with our performance and well-being goals. So step one is mindfulness. So mindfulness is simply present moment awareness of what is happening with your behaviors, emotions, senses, and thoughts. It's knowing them as they're happening. This is many times, I think, taken for granted in a lot of training, right? Even in like traditional psychological skills training or in social emotional learning in schools, or even in philosophies that have become popular in sport environments like 
stoicism with a, with a big X. They just assume that that awareness, that that pause, that that eye of the hurricane is there and it's not. And we know we have to be able to train for that. I think this is also part of the reason why mindfulness-based interventions across the board, mindfulness-based, eating interventions, mindfulness-based, smoking cessation, mindfulness-based, everything is so powerful is in large part because of this component. It's training for that quality of what we call scientifically meta-awareness. Step two is then, regardless of what's happening in your experience, you have to have the skills to be able to work with it. There's no wrong emotion. There's no wrong thought. We don't control thoughts. We don't control emotions. What we control is our ability to work with them. We have to have the skills to be able to do that. Those can be traditional psychological skills, or those can come more from the contemplative framework of skills that we can work with so that we can manage the conditions, both the external conditions that are coming at us, but also the internal conditions that are arising. So I was with the rowing teams yesterday, and the way we were talking about this was they train every day to be able to race whether the conditions are choppy or whether the conditions are smooth. Okay? But do they train their minds to be able to race when the conditions are choppy and when the conditions are smooth? Maybe they don't, right? So that's what we're doing, right? Regardless of what's here, we have to be able to work. With it. And the last is this is done in the direction of performance and well being goals. It's not done in a vacuum. And in some ways, sport environments are the perfect place to do this because the goal is really clear, right? We know what we're going after as a team. But then sport is metaphor for life also starts to become really clear, right? As athletes transition away from their competitive athletic careers, all of these skills can still be sustained. And the last piece that I think is central kind of understanding, this is the Yerkes Dodson's per peak performance, is understanding we have this kind of optimal zone of performance, but do we have at any given moment, do we know where we're at on this curve? That's that self-awareness, that's the meta-awareness, and that's really, really powerful. Many of us don't know where we're at until we're stressed out, burned out, and injured, right? So we start to notice that a little bit earlier and then we get lots of benefits. Or if we're just a little too hyped, a little too jacked in that big moment, we've got ways to bring it back, right? Or vice versa. If we're not up, then we have ways and skills to be able to bring it up. I also want to share a little bit about some of the current research that we're exploring here at uh, UW Athletics. So the first is with Boston University. So this is uh, work that uh, Peter Piasecki is leading there. And what he wants to do, it's qualitative research, where he's going to look at kind of comparing the, the work that's happening here in meditation training in my role to more traditional clinical sports psychology roles. And this is well established now in modern athletic departments, whereas the work that we're doing here is, is new and novel. So what are those pieces that make it unique and make it different? How does it kind of shake out so that we can start to have, you know, if this work is to grow, we need to have evidence in the literature of what those positions start to look like. At Rutgers, we have a, a cool collaboration going. This is happening with at Rutgers. His name is Pete Kanamu uh, in here, Wisconsin. David Lacoque, Director of Clinical Sports Psychology. Jen San Filippo in the room from Medicine. And Scott Anderson from Drew Watson's lab in kinesiology. Where what we're looking at here, scientifically referred to as acceptability research. There's nothing in the scientific literature that says athletes will actually meditate, right? Like we haven't done that acceptability research to know that that is true. So when people start to go after grants to start to explore next level questions, the funding agencies immediately say, well, where's the evidence? Not some article at uwbadgers.com that don't meditate. Like, that's great. We're happy for you. But like, what's the scientific research that says this actually favors this? With the Healthy Minds group. So I mentioned this group before, and this is a group that kind of still collaborate closely with in a variety of ways and, and learn a lot with. But one of the areas of research we want to begin to explore with them is what we might think of as active meditations. So we know scientifically that neuroplasticity is increased with aerobic activity, right? So your brain is able to learn more, right? At a, clipper, at a quicker clip after you do some exercise, right? But neuroplasticity is inherently neutral, right? It's there, but if we take advantage of that time to train the mind in certain ways, then maybe our gains can be even more sustained and grow even further. So one of the ways that we take advantage of this now is we'll do these practices oftentimes, you know, after lift, you know, or after practice where we know that neuroplasticity has increased a little bit, but also lots of open scientific questions to ask there. And then the, the last area of research we have uh, going with um, Badger, athletic, or Badger uh, athletic performance, and this is, Jen's involved in this as well, 
um, Scott Anderson, Drew Watson in the um, Watson Human Performance Lab um, have some data. And I'm gonna share kind of at high level some of the initial findings here, but caveat, this data is not yet published, not yet peer reviewed, but we think it's pretty robust and they gave me permission to share it. So what we did, um, what they did is they looked at the teams in Wisconsin athletics who had been training regularly with mindfulness and meditation and compared them to teams that had not been training regularly with mindfulness and meditation. So those are our two groups. Time point one was fall of 2019. So this is pre-COVID, right? Normal times. Time point two was summer, fall of 2020. Bad times, right? Season's getting canceled. We saw mental health plummet for basically every category of human on the planet, right? Tough times. So what they did is we have like a baseline assessment that every student athlete takes every year. So we were able to look at kind of physical performance and also able to look at mental health and mental performance. And this is at a very high level, uh, but still it's you know something to look at. And on the physical performance at time point one, pre-COVID to time point two, the two groups more or less stayed the same. We didn't see any changes there. On the mental health and mental performance at time point one, pre-COVID, the two groups were pretty much the same. And then at time point two, the non-meditating teams, their mental health and performance went way down. Or for the teams that have been engaged in the training, their mental health and performance stayed pretty much the same. So to me, this is an unbelievably exciting find. Normally we don't get excited about like, oh, things stayed the same. <laughs> That's not a thrilling finding. But here, when we know in this situation, Normally, most people are going to fall way off, but maybe there's some, and scientifically we would talk about it as like some protective element that's happening as a part of this training to sustain that over time. Not only is that potentially really helpful for overall well being, but if we think about that in a performance context, right? Is an athlete or a coach after a stressful experience going to want to be down here or going to want to be up here, right? They're going to want to sustain. This research mirrors research findings that have come out of Amishi Jha's lab as a neuroscientist at University of Miami. She does a lot of work in a military context where she found something similar in pre-deployment Marines. So right before a really stressful experience, this training seems to have protective benefits. But what about it on different time scales? What about the stress of a long season? Okay. We're gonna see things fall off for many athletes, right? many coaches. Well, what if we were able to maintain that? Right? Or at a different time scale, even during a match, right? You know, Grace is right in front of me, so it comes back to mind, right? You know, we had like back-to-back -back five set matches, right? Like again, I'm not claiming that meditation was the reason that happened, right? But like, is there some, is there something that's happening on a different time scale to be able to sustain that sort of balance, that sort of eye of the hurricane? We talk about we want poise all the time in our athletes. I think we might be training for that. When we do these practices in the, these environments, the first thing most folks say is they feel calm, they feel relaxed. Of course, calm and relaxed in a high intensity environment, that's poise. So I think there's evidence to suggest that we're training for that. So future research, I think all of it's open for future research, right? Like we're, I think we're just scratching the surface. So some of the things could be, you know, what's acceptability of this training look like in more environments? What are the capacities that are required of certain trainers to be effective trainers? What are the key kind of uh, you know, content pieces that need to be present? What are some of the distal and proximal measures we can start to pick up on? Do we start to see things like you know, sustained attention increase? Do we start to see weight uh, gains in the weight room increase? And then do we eventually start to see things start to show up in sport environments like you know, reduction in unforced errors, things like this, right? All open questions. Longitudinally. What happens when we start to track these athletes for five, 10, 15, 20 years after they've received this training here? So many research questions, I think, across all of these areas that are important. And one that I want to name again that's really important is decentering dominant groups in the research. Okay? So traditionally, white folks have been the one leading the trainings, they've been the one leading the science, and they've been a large part of the participants. Okay? So we need to interrupt that process. That has to be part of the research moving forward. And start to leave you with this. So 50 or 60 years ago, most elite athletes were lifting weights, right? Thought it would make them bulky, heavy, wear their bodies out. And now, of course, uh, weight training is just a part of every athletic program everywhere. Shout out to Muma, who's both a meditator and, a, you know, lifts weights. 
And now this is just integrated in all aspects of training. So might what we're exploring here at Wisconsin Athletics in another five, 10, 15 years be on a similar trajectory where, and I had to put this in, okay? Like, where this way of training is just built in to how high performing teams operate. It's no longer optional to what it takes. It's part of what it takes to perform at the elite level. So just reflecting for a moment, did I do my job? Another thing for you, like what came up kind of in these areas. So I wanna thank all of you for, for being here, everyone on Zoom for joining uh, and also I'm very aware that I'm only allowed to be here because I've known and benefited from a tremendous amount of amazing people. Uh, some of whom I was able to put their names up on the slide. Uh, and without their wisdom, without their care, without their leadership, without their vision, I wouldn't be here. So I'm thankful for them. Uh, and the last one, because I got to leave you on, like as a meditation teacher, I'm contractually obliged to bring in a little bit of woo-woo, like we have here. Will kick me out of the club if I don't. <laughs> is so the the person on the right, maybe you all are familiar, Antonio Machado, 19th century Spanish poet, right? <laughs> As we all think about. Antonio Machado has a great line, great poem. And in Spanish, it's caminante, no hay camino. En el camino se hace el path. In English, it's pathmaker, there is no path. It's in the walking that the path is made. So I don't like to walk around being like, you know, we're trailblazing some stuff. You know, Pete can drop it on Twitter and say that, you know, and that's, that's great, I appreciate it, right? But we're doing some things that I think are pretty novel and pretty cool here at Wisconsin Athletics. And we're figuring it out. And these are some of the bases that we're doing it. And I invite all of you to be a part of that, right? What does this look like as we collaborate together to integrate this training moving forward? So stay in touch, social, any way you'd like. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. I think we have time for a couple questions. And I, before I say that, um, for, for those who have not done so before, there are these little QR codes on your a lot of the tables. And please feel free to check in with that. If all We have a big Zoom crowd. Um, please feel free to share your info with us, with Maria or myself or Chad. And we would like to keep you in the loop. And I'm going to start off with a question, Chad. A, a lot of what I heard you talk about was in the in, for in performance and in competition, have you um, worked with coaches on, on on mindfulness training themselves, both as how do how do they perform at their highest levels with the benefit of mindfulness, but then also how can they almost be um, I don't I don't want to botch my wording, but like complement what you do and how they work with their teams. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so the, the first answer has this work happened with coaches? Absolutely, it very much happens with coaches sometimes. It's separate, kind of parallel with the athlete, but a lot of times it's together. It's having them in the room at the same time. I think there's a lot of power there uh, where normally there's a big power differential, right, between student athletes and coaches. So when they're in the room training at the same time, kind of learning together, something interesting can happen while, of course, acknowledging the dynamic changes when a coach is in the room and there's times to have that not be the case. Um, and then kind of to the second point, there's this uh, friend and collaborator, Chris McKenna is his name, he does a lot of work in education. And what he says is the intervention is the teacher's nervous system. So like the training is the nervous system of the person who's teaching, right? It's Kevin in the weight room. It's Kelly on the side of the floor, right? If he's, if they're freaking out, well, then everyone else is gonna start freaking out, right? So then being able to take that training for themselves, uh, I think is gonna have huge impacts, you know, both across performance and well-being. I did kind of highlight the performance part today, but the, one of the things I love about meditation is it's training the mind. Mind's always with us. So it's with us when we're training, it's with us when we're competing, it's with us when we're studying, hanging out in the community you know, across every aspect of our life. Thank you. Thank you. Who else has questions? I have a question. You mentioned a couple of times the word well-being. Mm. Um, I guess I'm just curious about how you operationalize that, how you and your team, how do you work with athletes around what that means? them and how that integrates into the Sure. Yeah, it's a really good question. So, um, you know, a couple things come to mind. So one is that I think in sport, there can sometimes exist an idea that in order to perform at really high levels, one's well-being has to be sacrificed. 
I don't think that's true. Right? In fact, I think that's detrimental. It's definitely, in my opinion, detrimental over the long run. Right? It may work in the short term for a little bit, but if we want to be great for a long time, we have to be able to tend to both of those. So sometimes we, we talk about it with athletes that, you know, this training for different athletes is going to show up first in different environments. For some, it may be more in the performance realm. For others, it may be more in the well-being realm, which is an artificial distinction, but it's kind of like those non-sport places. When they're uh, trying to fall asleep, you know, when they're relaxing with their friends, when they're just enjoying themselves, right? In some of those environments. And then they slowly start to bring it into those sport environments. Um, and then, of course, you know, scientifically, there's a lot of good research on well-being and a really good research on the impacts of meditation and mindfulness for well-being. Um, but I knew from the very beginning that if I came into a sport environment, if I came into, you know, with these retired NFL guys, if I come into the, the volleyball locker rooms and all I talked about was well-being, it's not going to last very long. Right? High performers are interested in rocking and rolling. Like, let's, I don't have time for all this self-care stuff, right? You know, these are just some of like the cultural things that exist, right? But they're not at odds with each other. We can do both. And when we do both, then I think we really catalyze you know, all elements. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chad, when you talk about uh, meditation training for sport, I'm curious, do you adjust your training practices if you're working with a team sport as opposed to an individual sport. So I know you used the Jonathan Taylor example and you talked about his relaxed readiness pre-snap, right? Yeah. Knowing that he has to rely on yeah. other people around him for his success. Is that training, that pre-snap training, the same or is it adjusted for a golfer pre-swing who only has themselves to, to rely on that, that success or, uh, or failure? Great question. Uh, so my first response is, in my mind, it's still an open question, right? It's like one of the questions that I'm constantly tracking to see, like, how does it shake out in these different environments? And there's emerging, yes, there are differences in, you know, sport environment or in collective environments versus more individual environment. So um, quick story comes to mind. This student athlete gave me permission to share this. is a, a track runner. Uh, and he would notice that, you know, very talented guy, but when 800 meter runner, when you get to the start line and kind of a couple minutes before, he's kind of checking everyone out, right? And at this level of sport, they all know each other, right? They all know each other's times, right? And then doubt would start to come up, right? Thoughts, you know, self-defeating thoughts would start to come up, right? And then, you know, obviously hinder his performance. So we start to do this training. We're training attention. We're training attention, be present with the body, you know, noticing those, you know, thoughts as they start to wander off and come back. And the first meet that he had after we first started to train, so he's, you know, kind of doing body scans, he's doing some mindful walking, and then he gets to the start line and he notices, he looks down, he's like, damn, my calf looks good today. <laughs> and then PR did. Okay? So again, I'm not claiming that meditation was the reason that he PR did, right? But kind of like the ways that it shows up in those environments, like um, the, the Jonathan people in this example, they're both about training attention. They're both about being that eye of the hurricane. They're both about working with emotions, working with thoughts. But how it comes alive in those different environments is going to look very different. And from a training perspective, like how I show up, the language that I use, the examples that I use, that of course has to change to match the environment. Good question. I'm going to finish with a Zoom question. Yeah. Uh, Josh, we can we got you queued up here. All right. Can you uh, hope you can hear me, Chad? But that that was awesome. So thank you for that. I um, particularly enjoyed the the research elements that, that you brought in um one question that i have is for sports psychology professionals who work um with athletes either individual athletes or groups um do you have any practical suggestions for how to work in meditation training um maybe with a group that hasn't tried it before um in terms of you know more, more logistically where to start yeah a really good question. So I'll answer it first, not in the way that you asked it, but in a way that I think is important because that's what you do when you're in front of the room. <laughs> um, for those that are interested, I think, in bringing this work into their environments, there's uh, the personal practice of the person doing the teaching is the most important, without a doubt. Like the personal practice of the person doing the teaching is the driver of everything that's happening, right? Meditation and mindfulness isn't about the ideas. It's about the embodied experience of it. If the teacher doesn't know that embodied experience, 
then they're just teaching ideas and those will float away. They have to be rooted in the body for them to be known, right? So I would encourage anybody who's interested in this to practice, get yourself exploring, see what these things are like for you. Um, and then on a more practical level, I think about this work oftentimes, you know, those like zero entry pools, like the like ramps that you can like walk into. So at the beginning, you walk into those zero entry pools, you know, and it's like ankle deep. It feels good, right? On a hot day, it's refreshing. That feels really, really nice. And so initial training can just be that. It can just be, you know, maybe it's as simple as like a, a four, five, six breath, right? Just something quick. You can kind of reset in the moment. But then as you're interested, you can start to take it a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper, right? And for the teacher to be able to do that, they have to have obviously quite a bit of experience, you know, over time and years. But that doesn't mean the shallow end of the pool is not valuable. That can be really, really helpful to start to include those things. And that's part of where I think the collaboration with more traditional sports psychology and folks like myself can be really beneficial. Traditional sports psychology can do work with mindfulness and meditation, but that's not their area of expertise. They won't have that same depth. But in working together, we can start to collaborate to create more impactful trainings. Hope that was helpful. Chad, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, again, this is exactly what we're hoping to do. Learn about the research, learn from top practitioners. And that, that was awesome, Chad. Thank you for all that you do. And thank you for being here. Thank you all for joining. Yeah, thanks thank all. You. I'm happy to all stay right. hanging. And I'm sorry that I have to make a quick exit.